Welcome to Perspectives from WFSU Public Media. I'm Tom Flanagan, and this program, again using the Zoom platform, pre-recorded on Wednesday, May 5th, for playback on Thursday, May 6th. The show to be aired on WFSU FM and also to be archived on WFSU.org. New numbers, just out, just got them. As of last month, Florida Department of Corrections recorded a population of 84,601. That's a lot of people certainly incarcerated across our state's vast network of prisons, but it's an almost 12% decrease from the prison population in Florida in 2019. Now, the number of inmates really hasn't been this low since 2005, and that was the, the last year the prison system reported holding fewer than 88,000 people in custody, and it has at times topped 100,000 just in recent years. So by almost any yardstick, this is a really positive development. Yes, it has been COVID related, certainly, but still there are fewer people that are being held in the state prison system here in Florida than we have seen heretofore, at least since 2005. Still the prospects though, for people who have been convicted of a felony and have fulfilled their sentence and then have been released from prison are less than outstanding. Let's be frank. Regaining the right to vote, which has been a very big issue, certainly is not the only challenge faced by these folks. Finding a job, a place to live, building a better life, all of these are fraught with multiple obstacles, but it's by no means an impossible task. There are many resources now available to smooth the transition from incarceration to success. We are going to talk about that today. We have a phenomenal panel who's going to help us explore these issues here on Perspectives. And let's uh, circle around the old uh, the checkerboard here uh, via Zoom and, and meet them. We want to say hi first to Rebecca Kelly Manders, founder of the ReFire Culinary Program and uh, founder of Street Chefs and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, Becca, it is so good to see you and, and how you making out here as we uh, go through these strange times. Hi, Tom, thanks. It's great to see you as well. Um, we're doing okay. Um, you know, as, as you said, yeah, I'm the owner of Street Chefs. We're actually celebrating 10 years of being in business today. And uh, ReFire is celebrating um, celebrating three and a half years, uh, going on four years of, in existence. Um, as of next week, we will have 53 graduates of our eight-week training program uh, for formerly incarcerated individuals, persons with felony convictions. Um, we didn't slow down through COVID because we're housed in the Big Bend Homeless Coalition Hope community. So all of the food we produce goes to, to serve the women with children or families that are experiencing homelessness. Um, and it's, you know, like you were saying, there's, there's a lot that more that can be done. A lot, a lot of resources are cropping up and are available, uh, for individuals that have felony convictions. Um, but there is a whole lot more that can be done. So I'm really glad to be a part of this conversation today. Terrific. We're happy you could be part of the two, Becca. Uh, we, uh, right next door to you here is, uh, Larry Bordeaux, director of re-entry programs for the Leon County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Larry, thank you for joining us here. And, uh, hey, uh, your patrol folks can take a little bit of time off here. We finally got the legislature out of town, so I'm sure the crime <laughs> numbers are, you know, on the downside there. But how have you guys been faring here in, again, a rather unusual time for law enforcement as well. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. And thank you very much for having me and all my esteemed colleagues here. It's great to see your faces. And uh, th this is such an important topic uh, for all of us, right? Um, uh, you know, I'll tell you, in, in reference to, um, you know, formerly incarcerated individuals and, and their success as they transition, uh, there are a lot of initiatives and a lot of things that I want to talk to you about that are buzzing around. And, and these folks uh, that you have here, my esteemed colleagues today, are all people who are helping make this happen. Uh, the sheriff's initiatives, uh, two of which I'd like to speak about today, uh, the Thousand Jobs for Youth initiative that you're going to be hearing more about, uh, and the All in Leon Business Pledge. For any of this to work, for, for successful transitions to work, 
this is going to take a community effort. This is going to be an effort between the, the sheriff's office, the, the city police department, the community, the business community, uh, and all of our valued service providers. It's going to take a village uh, to, to make this work. Uh, and, and what we're doing is we're, we're identifying uh, these folks, working with them while they're incarcerated. You gave a number. Uh, currently, uh, about 1,000 people from DOC come back to live uh, in, in, uh, in Leon County per year. Uh, it, it averages right around 1,000. Uh, we've got a new pathways program. We have the new continuum of care facility rise that's going to be opening soon. Uh, and these are all going to be ways in which we are going to try to take continuum of care to the next level to help make uh, uh, successful transitions occur. So I'm excited, completely excited to, to talk about all these things today. Thank you, sir. It's a, such a pleasure to have you as part of that conversation. Of course, you got to have jobs. You have to have gainful employment for folks to look forward to something other than whatever they had been doing before. And that's where we have uh, Don Papania, the owner of uh, Carver's uh, Discount Dry Cleaners, as one of the suppliers of the, those kinds of gainful and employers here in the area. Don, thanks for joining us here. And, and talk about your business first off, uh, just before we started rolling on this, you had mentioned that it had been a challenging time for the dry cleaning business and uh, your place in particular. So uh, how have you been surviving and how are you moving forward? Sure thing. First, uh, thanks for having me on, Tom. I greatly appreciate it. I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this team. Um, Business-wise, uh, we've been in business for around 15 years, and within the past year, I've, I've never seen, just as most businesses have not, seen such a, a drastic decrease in our business. Um, and as mentioned earlier, you know, you, it's basically the people who are going to work. So if you're not going to work, there's no need to get your clothes dry cleaned or washed or pressed and those type things. Um, everybody that uh, was attending the, the, the fun FSU games on the weekend, we lost all of those folks. And the folks that were going to church on a Sunday, we were losing those folks. But good news is we have definitely seen a, a strong rebound in our business, um, which I, I'm, I'm thrilled to say. And that's kind of what paired me up with uh, this great team here is uh, employees. That's the new challenge, I think, for any small business now is finding good, qualified employees. And uh, when I started talking with uh, Larry, it, it really made sense to me to offer a pathway to uh, uh, someone that is uh, looking for work, uh, driven to, to succeed and, and offer them an opportunity um, within our industry. And Very our good, sir. Thank you. Work, I, I want to explore that a little bit more and what your experiences particularly have been in, in that regard. Uh, we, we have a couple of folks here. They are board members of the Big Bend uh, After Reentry Coalition. And uh, Meisenzal, you are uh, first. Talk about your involvement in the coalition and, and uh, how you see that playing out. Gladly. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us because we all feel like this is such a fundamental discussion. I am so privileged, so fortunate, and continually inspired by the folks in our coalition. Um, I've been with the coalition since the beginning in 2012, when we met um, as a small group of community providers who are working with people re-entering from incarceration. And we've just grown and continue to build networking, collaborating, um, learning about the, all of the services that are available in the community, um, developing resources to help employers, to help um, people um, looking for services, to find out what's out there, and mostly empowering people to become productive and have positive and successful experiences after incarceration. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to share some of the resources that we've developed and to let people know how to get in touch with us because we are very welcoming of anybody in the community who's interested in this issue, whether or not you're involved with an agency or already doing this work, or if you're just interested in learning more and would like to be a mentor or would like to volunteer with a local organization. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to share uh, who we are and, and what we have to offer. You have a board colleague that you brought on deck too, Rashad Simon from over at the FSU College of Law. Rashad, and how did you get involved in the uh, Big Bend After Reentry Coalition? 
So yeah, I'm actually a recent graduate of the uh, University College of Law. It's a little baby lawyer over here. Um, and one of my professors is actually a, a board member as well. And she you know, just invited me to join this coalition because um, she knew that I was really interested in this work and that I wanted to do more in my community. And from there, this kind of beautiful pathway evolved um, for me to get more involved in the community and to do more of this work. For many folks who aren't aware of Rashad, uh, the College of Law has, besides being an academic institution and a training ground for new attorneys, also has been heavily involved in a lot of advocacy, whether it is talking about the uh, essential enslavement of people and uh, children, particularly in West Africa, uh, children under the age of 12 uh, being uh, tasked with life sentences in the courts, a lot of things going on over there. So to have that resource being brought to bear is a, is a very powerful thing too. But speaking of power, Disc Village has been a, a major factor in our community in rehabilitation and uh, getting people on, back on the right track for many, many years. Freddie Rouse, you are uh, certainly uh, part of that effort as well. So talk about how this village helps folks who have been through the uh, in the incarceration uh, pinwheel. Um, basically, um, this village provides a number of services, individual and family counseling in the areas of parenting, anger management, substance abuse, self-esteem and mental health. Uh, the primary goal is to um, help any individual that may be dealing with any type of um, you know, issues that they need help with the counseling uh, once they return back into the community. But my um, niche in this thing is that I was working for a organization called Living Stones International. That's how I got involved with BARC um, through my mentor, uh, Pastor Gary Montgomery. And so uh, he's been a, that particular organization along with BARC has been instrumental in going into the prisons and doing uh, programs such as Children of Inmates, where we actually brought, took the children into the, the to prisons on a special visit, not coinciding with the visits on the weekends. We pretty much took over the visitation part uh, during the weekday, like on a Wednesday, we brought in our own, we brought in catered food, gifts, and that gave the parents and the, and the inmates a time to bond. Then once we, we left, the um, institutions. We actually took the families to a little fun outing. We might take them bowling or, or, or to some type of park just to uh, let them know how much we appreciate them being a part of our our program. So uh, that's that's my niche. I, I've been doing this quite a bit, dealing with inmates. I'm currently a facilitator, but with uh, uh, doing 24/7 dash with Carter's Corner. So I actually go into the to the prisons and facilitate a group. For, of men who are who are fathers who are on their their way back into society, just to get them some um, additional tools um, to make them aware of how important it is to be a father to the kids. Even though they've been incarcerated, they can um, reestablish that bond, and that's sort of what this village does. Also, reconnecting families, reunifying families. All right, sir. And there's a lot of mentorship programs I notice around the area right now as well that are helping in that regard. Many of, uh, especially the young men who wind up in, in prison, really have not had any positive male role models that they can pattern their lives on. And that seems to be a major factor in how they got off the rails and into the system in the first place. So even after the fact, you're looking to do that reconnection, right? Correct. Now, currently, I, I, I mentor me and myself. Um, that, that is a lot of work, uh, mentoring as to going in, facilitating the groups each week. Um, and it does inspire me. And once you tell them a little bit about your life story, um, I'm, I kind of walk in, you know, in their shoes. I like to inspire the men to come out to be uh, better fathers, better, better to themselves. Uh, like, like I told the group last night, I like the phrase, build back better. Meaning I want to build back your life better, uh, getting back on the right track, but also being committed to your um, uh, resurrection from coming out of prison, being transitioning back into the community, but also reconnecting with jobs, housing, and other resources that we 
that we can uh, connect you to. So yeah, I'm a mentor of myself. I, I, I meet a lot of guys that I have um, encountered who have come out and, and just as you stated earlier, I have some success stories of men who have uh, bought into the concept and what we, we implemented and, and, and given to them to come out to inspire them to be better than what they were when they went into the um, to, uh, Department of Corrections. We're definitely going to go all around the, uh, the horn here and talk to everybody about any uh, stories that they have along those lines, because those are always inspirational. Rebecca Kelly Manders, I want to ask you, with the pullback here in the in the restaurant industry that we have seen during COVID, has that made things a little bit more challenging for the refire program? Because you get these folks trained, and uh, I, I have seen... <laughs> <laughs> through a number of visits out there to uh, uh, your uh, your school, your training facility, and also graduation, that these folks can crank out some incredible culinary masterpieces. But is, is that placement now more of an issue than it was? Actually, no. Um, every graduate that we had uh, in 2020 that was uh, able to work or felt comfortable going to work in the COVID environment um, got employed. There were only two graduates that we had last year. Um, one is uh, a little older and has some underlying health issues and wanted to wait till a vaccine was available. Um, and one had some transportation issues, but the rest of our 21 graduates from last year um, were all able to secure employment. Uh, so we didn't have a problem during COVID, uh, which was kind of shocking. Um, but you have to think that a lot of restaurants did that really, um, you know, that 180 degree kind of flip to, uh, you know, to the, to the curbside, to the, to the carry out model, you know, after the initial first four to six weeks of, uh, of the pandemic, everybody, you know, got, you know, into that shift and realized that this is going to be around a lot longer than we thought it was going to. So let's figure out what we need to do. And now I have, anywhere from four to six restaurants calling me on a weekly basis, asking me when the next round of graduates are coming out. Um, I can't graduate people fast enough um, to get them to get them jobs. It's, it's they're just there is such a need for people uh, in, in every sector right now, but especially in the service industries, the hospitality industry. Um, so I have a, a guy graduating next week and he's pretty much going to have his pick of where he wants to go work just based on the number of restaurants that are calling me saying, I need somebody, I need somebody today, who do you have? That is an incredibly transformative statement. And I'm thinking, Larry Bordeaux, that is a real flip on what we have seen traditionally, which is what is one of the first five questions on any job application? Have you ever been convicted of a felony? And usually that was the kiss of death. You've said yes to that you are out of there, regardless of what other qualifications that you might have. Why has that changed, do you think? Well, you know, sometimes I think that uh, we evolve for the better, right? And, and so what we've noticed is that one of the core key components to someone's successful transition is gainful employment, right? And so one of the things that we're, we're doing at the Leon County Sheriff's Office, and we can't do this without our service partners and, and, and all the great people you're, you're talking to today, we're starting a transition plan for everyone who has a transition date. We have a transition plan and that plan, one of the key components is to making sure that they have the resources necessary to be able to survive when they go out into the community, that they have the resources necessary, that they're able to, uh, uh, become as self-sufficient as they can, as soon as they can. Uh, and, and a big component of that is gainful employment. So what, what we at the Sheriff's Office have, have uh, looked to do is we have recruited businesses, businesses like Carver's uh, with Don, uh, you know, who have come to us and said, we believe in this. We believe in giving someone a second chance that that initial, uh, uh, you know, mistake that they made we believe that people can and do change. And, and starting from there, we develop relationships with the business community and we have them come to the table. They take a pledge that they believe in what we're doing uh, and that they are interested in allowing our, our formerly incarcerated to buy for jobs when they have them available. 
Uh, and really, the, this is it's become amazingly successful. And you're right, Tom, uh, the transformation, the transformation is heading in that direction. I'll tell you, uh, just real quick, I've got some great success stories, starting with carvers. Uh, you know, we, we, we have got to the point now where our case managers are working so diligently that we're actually getting gainful employment, real, true, gainful, full-time employment uh, prior to them even transitioning out at times. So we're, that, that's an exciting thing for us because, again, the more tools and resources that they have when they leave and transition, the better. But recently, uh, and, and I don't want to take, uh, I'm going to let Don talk about that one. Uh, Waste Pro uh, has hired three of our formerly incarcerated uh, uh, just here recently. And Stallmeyer's Meatpacking Plant uh, in, um, in Madison County reached out to us and they want to grow their business. They have about 100 jobs uh, and they want to offer them to formerly incarcerated individuals and work with us. Uh, just recently, seven uh, of the, uh, of the uh, 100 that they intend to create uh, have been hired. And of those, uh, three of them were currently incarcerated and getting ready to uh, transition out when they were hired. So uh, what an amazing uh, time it is to see uh, the amount of businesses that have stepped forward and, and are ready to take that pledge and partner with us to help make these transitions more successful. That's terrific, Larry. And Don, no pressure there after that setup. <laughs> but uh, tell us that that story, that success story that Larry just referenced. Well, I was in uh, need for uh, someone to press our clothes. You know, we we wanted to add to that team because, as as I mentioned earlier, our business was improving, and uh, Larry and his team had uh, mentioned that they had a wonderful young woman that was getting ready to to, to come out and. Uh, invited her in for an interview, spoke with her, and I could not have been more impressed. Um, to this, She's actually here working right now, and this is day three. And um, I'm talking about someone that is willing to adjust their schedule. And back up a second. You got to keep in mind as the business owner, these folks are just coming out of being incarcerated. And on day one or two, they're at a job interview. You're asking them to work a, a schedule with certain hours. So it takes a little bit for them to say, absolutely, we'll take the job but I also need to figure everything else out. We worked with, uh, Cassandra's actually her name, um, a little bit on those, uh, those few things, working those out. And within a day or two, this woman has learned how to operate a mechanical press. Um, your shirts are coming out or a customer's shirts are coming out absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm offering her more hours, more time, more pay. Could not be, could not be happier. Um, on top of that, outside of just Cassandra, I think as a business owner and someone hiring uh, within the labor force, one of the things you look for is uh, loyalty, someone that is going to be appreciative of the opportunity that you're, that you're providing them, uh, uh, especially to a team that's welcome as well. I see that from all of these folks that come in uh, and want to work. So I think it's an awesome talent pool. I really do. I think it's one that's been overlooked for, 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 for too long. And what are the beyond the specific skills that are necessary for a, a job like Don's, you know, working the press and figuring out which chemicals apply to, you know, various cleaning situations and all. Beyond that, what are the life skills that a lot of these folks need and how can they kind of catch up on those? Because many people just, I mean, even balancing a checkbook might be an insurmountable task for some folks. Right. Think, right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was yeah. just going to say uh, that's another part of, of, of the owner wanting to take the initiative to, to assist them as well. You know, and, and you help them. You talk through, like I was mentioning with Cassandra. I mean, she was, which I greatly appreciate, very open and informing me that uh, she's not sure how her schedule is going to be. She's not sure if she can come in by the times we were asking. But if as, as a person to person, you, you offer assistance, you talk through it, you give them a few days to figure those things out, and they eventually do figure it out. And once they come into work, you follow up with them and ask them, just as you would a, another employee, how are things going? How can we adjust? How can we make things better for you? Um, she happens to have, a, I think, a six-month-old uh, daughter. She needs Thursdays. So we offered Thursdays off, but she can come in earlier on a Friday. So you have to be, just to be able to work with people and you end up with a very good employee. 
No, that's terrific. And anything you want to throw in there again, I mean, just coming from DOC custody when everything is so regimented, you know, when you're going to go to bed and you're going to get up and you're going to eat and all, there's no decision making process involved there. When you are on the outside, though, it's it's all up to you, as Don said with Cassandra. So, you know, how, how do you bring people kind of, you know, back into the mainstream again? I think this uh, really points to some of the points that Freddie was making and a couple of us have talked about the key is mentoring and support. Someone has called it open arms. This idea that as a community, we recognize all the various needs that people have and they're everything from transportation, um, access to transportation, money to afford a bus pass, um, finding a place to live, a stable housing. Freddie always talks about how important housing is to folks. Um, support for whatever mental health or substance abuse issues someone might have. Um, some, some people have been incarcerated for so long that they've never used a cell phone or a computer. So the kinds of basic skills that um, we take for granted if we've been living out, out in the community are not things that people necessarily know how to do or how to access. So mentors, organizations that will work with people, um, kind of hold their hands. Uh, someone said beautifully the other day, um, well, you don't want to hold people's hands. And she said, or how long do you continue to hold someone's hand? And she answered by saying, we hold their hands until they need to let go. In other words, we're gonna provide whatever, as a community, whatever folks need to be successful so that they don't recidivate, so that they're not um, tempted to um, go off the rails, as you said, Tom, in order to provide for their needs, but instead feel welcome and um, supported. The RISE Center that Larry's gonna tell us about is gonna be an incredible asset in terms of immediately having a place to go to talk to someone who can help guide you through all the various things that, as Don was saying, that people need in order to be successful. That's terrific. And, and Larry, we will catch up on that here in just a second. I want to ask Rashad the one other thing though, is how do you bring more organizations to bear on this problem. We have a great representation here, but there are, are many, many others in the community uh, that maybe could lend a hand in this whole process. So are you actively looking for more folks to get involved in this in this whole effort? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that um, I, I want to echo what, what um, Anne and Larry were talking about as far as it's going to take a whole community effort in order to uh, to, to really bring people into success. And that means getting people to buy in into what we're doing, right? Spreading awareness about what we're doing, right? And so we invite everyone, you know, to come to um, our coalition meetings because you have a lot of people who are providing services already that are there, right? Um, and, and as soon as you get all the services together, then you start to realize that, uh, a lot of these things that people need are being provided for, right? And, and I think that what a lot of people don't realize is that all these things are connected, right? You can't have a successful employment without having housing. You can't have successful housing without having employment. You can't talk about transportation if no one has somewhere to go back to or to go to a job, right? And so it's about raising awareness, getting people to buy in and actually letting people know that they do have a part to play in this, right? Even if it's just buying in and saying, okay, there is something that we can do. Even if it's going to, you know, the, the, the local uh, legislature or your, your, your county commission and saying, okay, there are barriers that, that exist for people that are trying to obtain housing in our community that are coming out from jail and prison. What can we do about not only addressing those barriers, but breaking them down. Very good. And, and why don't you give a plug here for the meeting of the coalition, when you guys get together and how people can find out more and interface with y'all. I think, and our next meeting is June, or no, it's in May, next yep. week, right? Yep. May on um, Wednesday, correct? And we meet, yep, we meet, thank you. We meet the second Wednesday of every month and we've done that for, 10 years now, <laughs> except for July, we take July off. But the second Wednesday of every month from 1.30 to three, 
and we meet uh, via Zoom now, but hope to eventually meet back in the community. And Rashad, I'll just make a plug for how people can get in touch with us, which is to um, contact us through our website which is uh, www.bigbendreentry.org. Okay. The best thing to do is just contact us that way. Tell us you're interested in coming to a meeting and we'll put you on an email contact list and keep you up to date. So from thanks for asking about that. Because we love From which there is no going. escape once you're in that database. So. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which is a good thing. Freddie Rouse, I know Disc Village does an awful lot when it comes to substance abuse programs and all. And let's face it, a lot of folks, both on the inside and the outside, are struggling with, with these issues right now. What resources in the community? I mean, there are 12-step programs and all that. But what kinds of things can Disc Village provide to uh, mitigate some of these issues for folks who are, who are getting out and maybe tempted to fall back in again? Uh, basically, uh, it depends on the individuals uh, wanting to get help with any substance abuse or any mental health um, issues. Um, they can get in contact with our office and we can um, get them in contact with, a, uh, with our, what, how we will get them signed up. Uh, there may be a fee for some, but, but the service, but the department that I work in is actually free. It's free counseling, but it's also voluntary. So, uh, but we do work with a lot of DCF um, referrals. Uh, and that also include guys who are incarcerated who, who are trying to keep their parental rights. So that, and they, they have a case manager in that, in that right to help them keep that open uh, for us, their parental rights. But other than that, um, it's just basically on what they need and how they reach out to our, to our organization for any, any kind of help. All right, but that's, that's sort of a holistic approach too. And that can be a stabilizing influence in the life of someone who is just getting out of, of a prison term instead of being totally blown off by their family to reconnect with, with those family members as a support structure to help them as they return. You know, I was just thinking last night about, uh, and after we had got through talking, about how you know with the with the unemployment piece and with when Rashad was talking about the housing, how a lot of guys, um, you know, because of their their felony convictions and then a credit check and then a, a, a then you got to do a um a fit a application fee which is fifty dollars. I was thinking about how you know and you know even with our with our organization, there should be some type of aftercare for about six months with these guys, you know. Not holding their hands, but just being, you know, that involves mentorship, providing them with jobs, transportation, and housing. Because um, over that six months period of time, and also dealing with their addictions, because, you know, like when they're coming out, right, they, they still may have the addictive behaviors. So we want to continue to address that honestly, and that they're committed to want to continue to heal because we're, we're actually continuing to help them here by when they come back, transitioning back into the community with a job and, and especially a, a roof of my head, that helps me not go back into my addiction. That sounds like the RISE Center that already came up. I'll get to you in a second here, Rebecca, but uh, Larry, talk about that and, and that concept that uh, the SO is looking at to maybe provide those kinds of resources in a one-stop shop. Yeah, absolutely. So what we're doing, uh, we have created a place called the Rise Center. Um, and, and really and truly, that's a reentry through innovative services through empowerment. And really and truly, the goal of that is to bring all the service providers, because remember, Tom, uh, oftentimes these service providers are great people that have great missions, but they oftentimes work in silos. And so sometimes we have a lot of great service providers doing great things here, but maybe some of us don't know what they're doing and, and the communication isn't there. So we've brought together not only the RISE, but the system that we're using to help bring all these providers in and keep track of the referrals and, and matching people with certain needs to services is the SPIRIT program. And the SPIRIT platforms, the Suppression, Prevention, Intervention, Referral Intelligence Tool, we call SPIRIT. Uh, what, we, what that system does for us is, you know, what, 
we've had for many years is Big Ben 211. It's a great organization full of, uh, full of great uh, uh, information and it, it empowers people to be able to know where they can go to get help. What Spirit does is we have providers who come aboard with Spirit, they get trained and it's a it, it and it's that referral tool. So you know, if you call Big Ben two one one and you say, "Hey, I need service for, for X, Y, and Z," they give you a phone number and they give you, you tell you how to get those services. What Spirit will actually do is you put your information in there. Like we at the detention facility, we provide an assessment to all the uh, to all of our clients. That assessment outcome, we can use that information to build the transition plan and elicit the services of the service providers through Spirit because that system will actually pair those needs with the providers who actually have the, the programs uh, and services that they so desperately need. And we do all those referrals through Spirit. So the RISE Center, again, is going to be a place where we bring all those, uh, those service providers. We'll have regular business hours there. Uh, and it's a place where once you uh, transition into the community, we're going to continue to provide care through that transition plan uh, for, for a year and even past a year uh, until, like, I believe it was Ann that said, uh, you know, we're going to continue to provide those services until uh, it's time that, uh, that you're able to be self-sufficient. Um, and, and again, it's going to be that center and our service providers and all of our, uh, our, our wonderful community members that have bought into this, uh, where it'll start there, but it'll continue until they're able to transition in and their needs have been met. Uh, and, and again, uh, our hope, and, and I believe this to be true, when we do this and we do it right, recidivism rates are going to go down, uh, employment's going to be up, and we're going to have a situation where we have a lot of formerly incarcerated that are able to live, work, and play in, in Leon County and, and have that uh, successful transition. Uh, one of those providers uh, that we're going to be having a special partnership with is Re Rebecca and Refire. Uh, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that and bring Rebecca into that because we're going to be doing a lot of amazing things with them as well. That is terrific. Uh, let, let's find out about that. For, first, though, Larry, what is the time frame on the actual grant opening, ribbon cutting, whatever, for the RISE Center? Yeah, so I don't want to uh, get ahead uh, too much, but uh, I have some pretty reliable uh, information that that's going to be probably in later July of this year, early August. So uh, coming very soon to Leon County residents is going to be rise, uh, and we're excited. Uh, uh, the sheriff's very excited to see that uh, that continuum of care component realized. I have a weird uh, premonition that Shonda is going to be cranking out some kind of a media advisory on that. So, I, yeah, I definitely want to be up for the uh, the grand opening for that. Rebecca, talk about how, how you're going to kind of interface with this whole thing here. Absolutely. Well, we're, uh, you know, Larry and I have been talking about how we can uh, get the training process started for people who are in the detention center so that when they walk out of the detention center, they're they're almost ready to walk right into a job. You know, how we can take the refire model and bring it behind the walls so that we can help those that are interested in the culinary arts or interested in the hospitality field, go on and get the ball rolling, get the classroom component knocked out of the way because um, my class is a 250 hours, approximately 250 hour class. And the first 80, 85 hours of that is just a lot of classroom, a lot of food safety, sanitation, um, you know, learning about foodborne illness and how to prevent it and things that you have to do to make food safely. Uh, so if we can, you know, get that component rolling um, while someone is still incarcerated, while they're in the process of getting to that transition date. So then they transition out and the next day they're in my kitchen and they're getting the hands-on experience and they're putting what they've already, what they've already learned to work and I'm seeing where they are, how they flow and getting them referred out to jobs, getting them applying to jobs. So instead of it being the eight week program completely on the outside, it's gonna be a little more of a hybrid program. And that's what we're trying to work out to try and be a maximum benefit to the individuals who are currently incarcerated as well as individuals who are coming back from state prison or federal prison or who are still on probation. Um, and it's, you know, it's gonna be a really, I think it's gonna be a really great partnership for us to 
to work together because ReFire is the only um, peer run uh, program in the area that uh, well, you know, being someone who has navigated the criminal justice system successfully, um, I understand what people are going through and being able to have graduates that work with me to help my current students, you know, having that, uh, that mentoring aspect that everyone's talked about is really, I think, the biggest key to, uh, to our success rate is that people come into my program and they see that, you know, it's not just some pie in the sky, it's tangible, it's something that they can achieve and can accomplish. And um, you know, you, you were saying earlier, you know, like how, what kind of success stories we have. And I'm just sitting here trying to just pick one. And uh, I, you know, I've got so many uh, incredible people that have just changed my life by coming through the refire program um, that it's, it's, it, you know, the, the gifts that they've been able to give me from that have just been amazing. Um, you know, watching one of my graduates be able to um, she lost everything uh, while she was incarcerated because of Hurricane Michael uh, destroyed everything where she uh, where she was living in uh, in Panama City. So came to Tallahassee, uh, came through my program, was staying with a, a family member, was able to graduate, get a job, get an apartment, get her son back, get her driver's license back, and buy a car all within 18 months. Um, and it, just to watch her grow and you know, get those phone calls and texts from her saying, hey, chef, this is what I'm doing. This is what's happening. Things are great, you know, and I have another graduate who's about to gra finish uh, his associate's degree and he's uh, he spent ni over 19 years incarcerated. He is going to become a social worker uh, like like Freddie, and he wants to help uh, young young people and young men not take the path that he took. So, you know, having just seeing all these people that get empowered is just, I think, the, the icing on the cake. And if we can get more members of the community involved, um, you know, that's more the better. Let's get some more since it, uh, time draws nigh here. Uh, and uh, what, what's your favorite success story? I know you have a bunch, but does one just pop out at you and say, boy, I, I want to share this one? I'm going to, um, I have a lot of stories as a, as a teacher. I worked inside of the jail, the detention facility for many years in different capacities and um, always was very excited to um, share the resources in the community with folks and then to, um, but I didn't often follow up with them to know how they did, but they were really excited to, um, uh, in it. well, one, one thing I will say that I really enjoyed doing was practicing interviewing skills with people who are inside of the facility to give them the opportunity to talk honestly about their experience and to um, uh, recognize that it was okay to uh, tell the truth in an interview um, and to brag on all their accomplishments and to um, talk about themselves in a positive light um, and then to be able to let them know that there were resources in the community like Don, who actually were willing to help people. So I think that actually the RISE Center is my idea of a big success story because of the fact that we're, and all the reentry work that the Sheriff's Office is doing that is gonna really facilitate that transition for folks. So can I say one more thing that's not a success story, but just a way to um, uh, help people get involved to, to segue on what some of the other folks were saying is um, I just wanna, say that I'm very aware that during this past year, I think a lot of people are hungry both for more information and also opportunities to volunteer and help because of the pandemic, because of racial and criminal justice issues that we've all been learning so much about. This is a great way to do that. Um, we have a resource guide on our website that gives a, a very comprehensive look at all the different agencies that are out there that people can volunteer with. And as I say, again, um, join us at our meetings to meet all of these fabulous folks and learn more about what's happening. Fantastic. Don, you had your hand up there, sir. I did. I just wanted to mention one other quick thing. You know, we, we, we mentioned that we're, we're in dire need for employees. And this is another opportunity or another talent pool. But for a small business owner, there's also a tax advantage. Uh, to hiring uh, recently incarcerated people. It's, uh, it's titled the, the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. And each employee could get uh, up to $2,400 in tax credit. Uh, and it's unlimited. You could hire as many employees uh, as, as needed and you'll receive a $2,400 tax credit. 
uh, the way it works is it's a 40% the first year, 25% the second year. So uh, outside of uh, uh, helping the community, um, helping employ these, 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 these good folks, you also can receive an incentive for doing so via a tax credit. A good motivation if you needed any additional. There it is right there. Rashad Simon, any uh, success stories you'd like to share, sir? Oh, wow. I mean, not not really any success stories um, yet because I'm still kind of very young in this work um, myself. But I do just want to just quickly talk about kind of the, the legal side and the legal barriers that exist and, and how... Um, people can become successful, right? And so, you know, there are 45,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that exist across the, the nation that um, create barriers for people when it comes to employment, housing, and, and voting rights and stuff like that. And from the moment that you're arrested, you start to um, obtain legal financial obligations, right? And so when I say it takes a buy-in from the whole community, I mean that it really takes people acknowledging that, you know, these barriers exist and that if you want people to become successful, if you want people to become productive members of society, that you have to, like I said, address those barriers and break them down, right? And I am very happy that you, you get the buy-in in our community from the law enforcement side, because that is often a barrier in other communities where you don't have the buy-in from, you know, the, the law enforcement side that that uh, prevents people from becoming successful as they as they transition out of um, incarceration. Actually, Rashad, what you just pointed out was a community success story. I think. Exactly. Exactly. As Anne said. As Anne said. Get and you know we we have a sheriff that is really engaged in reentry. And so, you know, that, that is a community success story, as Anne said, you know, especially with the Rice Center and having all these service providers really come together and, um, and provide for uh, the former incarcerated. Well put, sir. Freddie Rouse, any ideas you'd like to share along that line? Um, I would really like to see um, something modeled after the Ready for Work platform. The Ready for Work platform was a, um, a genius of a concept to help incarcerated um, women and men come out of society, transitioning back into the um, society by offering them not only career development, uh, opportunities, um, paying for their housing for the first three months, which is so vital. That That is so vital. That the housing, along with um, connecting them with um, businesses like Don and we also uh, connected with uh, different um, other businesses across the city. I mean, we had a great success rate uh, with getting people to go to work. We, we partnered with Rebecca and Refire. I mean, we, I mean, that I think that model needs to be looked at for as uh, a whole community uh, perspective, even from the, with the sheriff department, um, the local government, city government. We need that type of platform back, man. It was, man, it, it took, it brought a lot of people out of the ashes. You know, you, you said from beauty to ashes, when you get people coming back into um, to society, the first thing they're looking for, they're running for a job, like Don um, said. We need, I need a job. And that's very, cause they're afraid. But also I need a place to stay. I don't know where I'm, wanna, where I'm going to stay, right? And then also career development um, tools, telling them, learning how to do it, a resume and, and, and learning how to dress for success. Uh, we, all of those things are very vital. And I was a part of that particular um, organization. And we have um, like um, one young man, he's currently working at, if you go to Longhorn, um, his name is Mr. Henderson. He has come out. He's a tall gentleman, wear glasses. He's, he's successful. He has came out. He's gotten married. And man, he's doing phenomenal. So I think with everyone, you know, um, saying that we need jobs and, and housing and things of that nature, those are vital. And we got refire and businesses like what Don, Don Carver is doing. I'm going to be a part of that also. I have I still communicate with, with people from this end because when I go into the prison, 
guys that's man, Mr. Fred, I need a place to stay. I need, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I need a job so I can reach out to Don. I can reach out to Rebecca. I reach out to um, uh, Long Keepers. I got a young, another gentleman named Max. I, uh, I'm still in that business, even though I'm not actually uh, still working with Ready for Work, but I'm still wearing the hat part of uh, being a, um, a BART member. So yeah, um, the, that's what I think is so indifferent. If you look that up, that, that Ready for Work platform, it is mind blowing how it takes people just like the success story that Rebecca talked about with the young lady from 18 months. But when you come out, they are going to give you um, a stipend. They give, they, give, they give you opportunity. You put a little money in your pocket. Not only that, we're going to get you a job. We're going to get you career development. We're going to teach you how to write a resume. But also, we're going to get you a job. So, man, I think that needs to come back to this area because that's what we're hearing. I'm hearing that from my old director. People still call them about where it's ready for work. So, yeah. Well, I think you have just informed us, Freddie, that uh, we need a <laughs> lot more than uh, a new suit of clothes and a bus ticket when we get out. Yes. And all of you have done just a remarkable job of letting, I think, a larger public know exactly what is available, what is out there, and what more needs to be done in order to drive this effort forward and have far more success stories than what we talked about today. We will have to circle back and do this again, maybe yes, on sir. an annual basis, mm -hmm. so we can see how this is progressing as we go forward. Because I have a strange feeling if we implement what we've been talking about today, we are not going to save, just save a lot of lives, which is the primary thing. This community can save a lot of money at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. when it comes mm -hmm. to the cost of recidivism and mm -hmm. incarceration and all of those kinds of things, the strain on the criminal justice system, the judicial system, all of that. And um, Larry Bordeaux, we're going to talk some more here about the, uh, the the upcoming grand opening as well. It's been a great discussion, folks. Thank you all. And I wanted to send another uh, shout out to Shelly Gomez, their uh, guiding light of the Frenchtown Heritage uh, Hub for helping put this together. Rebecca Kelly Manders, founder of the Refire Culinary Program. Larry Bordeaux at the Leon County Sheriff's Office, director of reentry programs. Don Papania, owner of Carver's Discount Dry Cleaners. Tell Cassandra we said hey, huh? And, mm. and <laughs> Mizen Zal and Rashad Simon, both board members of Big Bend after Reentry Coalition. And Freddie Rouse, of course, at Dis Village. Thank you all for being part of the discussion today. <laughs> On Perspectives, brought to you by WFSU Public Media in Tallahassee. Thanks to uh, Taylor Cox, Paul Dam, Amy Diaz de Viegas, Brandon Brown, Tricia Moynihan, Lydell Rawls, Director of Content, Kim Kelling, our Executive Producer, and I'm Tom Flanagan. Despite the severity of America's DUI laws, operating motor vehicles, which includes boats, while impaired, remains a serious and potentially legal problem. And we're going to talk about it next week here on Perspectives from WFSU Public Media. Take care.